¿vale? Pues buenas tardes a todas y a todos, bienvenidos a esta nueva sesión de los seminarios institucionales de la ENES Mérida. Eh, hoy tenemos a un invitado que está ubicado en, en Puerto Morelos, es el doctor Paul Blanchon. Eh, buenas tardes, Paul. Buenas tardes. Gracias por acompañarnos y por aceptar esta invitación a través del profesor José Carlos Pintado, a quien agrade agradecemos mucho esta iniciativa. Eh, el doctor Paul Blanchon nos va a hablar, bueno, nos va a dar una ponencia titulada Darwin's Problem with Caribbean Coral Reefs. Eh, el doctor Blanchón es geocientífico y su carrera inició como geólogo en el Reino Unido, en el Exploration Department of Phillips Petroleum en Londres, y mientras trabajaba ahí por las tardes estudiaba su licenciatura en el Birber College de la Universidad de Londres. Y fue al terminar que se fue a estudiar una maestría en el Instituto de Investigación Sedimentológica de la Universidad de Reino. Posteriormente obtuvo una beca de la Commonwealth para desarrollar su doctorado en la Universidad de Alberta en Canadá en el Departamento de Ciencias de la Tierra y de la Atmósfera y fue en el doctorado donde estudió el desarrollo de los arrecifes modernos alrededor de Gran Caimán y su tesis fue galardonada como una de las mejores tesis en geociencias en Canadá en el 1995. Después del doctorado, eh, realizó un breve postdoctorado en la Universidad de Indiana, en Estados Unidos, y tras esto tuvo ya su plaza en la UNAM, en el Instituto de Ciencias del Mar y Limnología, en sede Puerto Morelos, donde estudia los arrecifes del Caribe de la costa de la península de Yucatán. Y se ha dedicado a estos arrecifes no menos de 22 años y con esto ha publicado documentos en Nature, en Science y en otras revistas científicas internacionales en cuestiones que van desde impacto de huracanes, desde aumento de nivel del mar posglacial hasta los tipos de arrecifes de Darwin, que es de lo que nos va a hablar hoy. También ha formado a 20 estudiantes para, a estudiantes para que sean científicos y participa en comités editoriales en Frontier y Scientific Reports. Eh, entonces, pues sin nada más que añadir, damos pie al doctor para que nos ilustre con este conocimiento tan vasto que ha obtenido a lo largo de su carrera. Gracias, doctor. Por, adelante. Perfecto, muchas gracias por la introducción y por la invitación a dar un plática hoy. Uh, voy a hablar en inglés porque la introducción uh, con estas palabras uh, técnicas son un poco difíciles y yo no soy una buena persona para hacer la, la traducción, obviamente. <laughs> so, what I'll try to do today is I'll, I'll talk as slowly as possible um, so you can understand me. And... Um, If you have any problems, just tell me to slow down or, or, you, or you can uh, ask questions at the end if you're, not, if you're uncertain about uh, some things. Okay, so the talk I'm going to give today is entitled Darwin's Problem with Caribbean Coral Reefs. <clears throat> And this talk is basically a new look at these old, old uh, reef types that we've that we've uh, grown accustomed to in the, in, in the Caribbean and around the world. And what I want to do is, is give you a better insight into the, uh, the geomorphology and the distribution of these reefs, and, and also to get an idea of the factors controlling the development. And the good thing is the paper was accepted for publication today, this morning, so I feel a bit more confident about that. <laughs> about saying that you guys can then go look at it after if you've got any questions after the after the talk's over as soon as it's published. Um, okay, so let's carry on. As we all know, in 1842, Charles Darwin suggested that fringing reefs transform into barrier reefs and atolls as their um, volcanic islands subsided. So first of all, You can see that fringing reefs develop around an island that's stable. And then as that island gradually subsides, the fringing reef grows vertically 
and separates from the shore as the as sea level rises and the lagoon becomes deeper and it becomes a barrier reef. And then later in time, what happens is that central island grow, slowly subsides below sea level, leaving an atoll. But during Darwin's time, it wasn't widely known that sea levels um, oscillated up and down during the Pleistocene. In fact, he was aware of glaciation. But back in those days, they were under the impression that it was one long glacial cycle and that sea level had only risen and fallen once. But as we know, over the last um, two million years, over the, over the Pleistocene, Sea level has oscillated up and down several times in relation to the glacial interglacial cycles. And these glacial cycles are a big problem for Darwin's vertical growth hypothesis, because what it means is that every time sea level falls and rises, you get a new fringing reef developed. And if, it was, if, if vertical accretion was the only uh, parameter involved in this, in this reef development, then you get a new reef that would develop every time sea level fall and, and rose during glacial cycles. So we'd have more than one barrier reef in front of, in front of these islands, as you can see here. Now, I talked about this problem in a paper that I published in 2014 in Scientific Reports. And this diagram here shows that there are, the situation is much more complicated than Darwin envisioned. And fringing reefs um, basically track up slope and um, because they're restricted from developing vertically by sedimentation conditions. But to cut a long story short, the transition between fringing reef and barrier reef and atoll does occur, just not in the way that Darwin first envis envisioned. So in addition to this sequence, Darwin also suggested that there were the principal kinds of coral reefs differ little as far as related to the actual surface of the reef. So he basically thought that these three reef types looked the same on the surface. And the only differences were that uh, barrier reefs, um, the only difference were uh, an atoll differed from a barrier reef only in the absence of land within its central expanse. And a barrier reef differed from a fringing reef and only in being placed at a greater distance from shore and having a deeper lagoon. So these were geomorphological differences. The actual surface of the reefs looked the same. So in other words, what he was saying was that there's really only one reef type, but that reef type has three stages of development. So after looking at um, these reef types in the Indo-Pacific, Darwin moved his, his attention to the Caribbean, where unfortunately things don't, didn't go as planned. And he basically identified fringing reefs but was unable to mark on his map, which you can see here on the, on the right-hand side, any barrier reefs or atolls. So why was that? First, he thought the Caribbean reefs were different from his, these Indo-Pacific reefs that he'd grown so common to, to looking at. And they were discontinuous and they weren't located at the shelf edge, they were located further back. And when he looked at things that looked like barrier reefs, like in Belize, for example, the charts said that they were mostly composed of sandbanks and there wasn't that much coral. And other places like in Bermuda in, in the Atlantic looked like an atoll, but it wasn't surrounded by a barrier reef. It was surrounded by, or it wasn't surrounded by a reef. It was surrounded by uh, patch reefs, and the, even though the shelf was nice and wide. So compared to the Indo-Pacific, Darwin felt that barrier reefs and atolls had not developed or they were undeveloped in the in they weren't as developed as as they were in the Indo-Pacific. And he came to the conclusion that this was because there was a lack of subsidence. So let's put ourselves in Darwin's shoes for a moment and try and look at the differences. We'll, we'll use atolls as an example and we'll compare the difference between Indo-Pacific atolls and Caribbean atolls to see if he was right. So if you look at the uh, definitions of atolls in the literature, it's, they're fairly straightforward. They're, you basically have a um, circular coral reef surrounding a lagoon in which there are no islands and the reef develops um, at sea level and, and basically encloses all of the lagoon or, or a lot of the lagoon. Um, 
So let's start off with an Indo-Pacific atoll here in the Maldives. And you can see that the breakwater reef or the reef surrounds the entire lagoon. 95% of the perimeter of this, of this um, island is basically made of the reef. Okay, and you can also see that the reef, the reef rim on the south side is the same or looks virtually the same as the north side. Okay, so that's an Indo-Pacific, a very typical Indo-Pacific reef. Now let's move on to the Caribbean. Well, in the Caribbean, several, there are several um, publications that have identified atolls in the Caribbean. And so we'll look at four today. We'll look at Hogstai Reef in the Bahamas, Alacran Reef in the Gulf of Mexico, Chin, uh, Chinchorro Bank, in the southeast, southeast Mexico and Glover's Reef in Belize. So let's start off with Hogstai Reef here in the Bana shown here in the Bahamas. And you can see that the reef rim forms 83% of the perimeter. So in other words, the, the reef rim encloses pretty much most of the lagoon, 83% of the lagoon. So you could argue that this is very similar to the Indo-Pacific reefs. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. The next candidate is Alacran, Alacranis in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And you can see in this case, the breakwater reef only encloses 50% of the, of the perimeter, 53%. And the other half is an open margin or covered with uh, sand islands or sandbanks. Okay, so this really doesn't fit with Darwin's idea of an atoll. It's not surrounded on all sides by reefs, it's surrounded on only half. Let's move on to Chinchorro. Well, you can see Chinchorro is pretty much the same. The, the reef rim is only 51% of the, of the perimeter of the bank. Okay, so that leaves the, the, the a part of the bank that's open on the leeward side or, or, is, um, or has got sandbanks. And some of these sandbanks are submerged, some of these are, are at sea level. So in other words, the reef rim doesn't enclose the, 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 ent the entire lagoon. Finally, let's look at Glover's Reef in Belize. Now, Glover's Reef looks like the perfect atoll. Um, you can see that it, the reef itself forms 72% of the perimeter. And that, so in other words, three quarters of the reef surrounds the lagoon. But you can see in some areas that the, the rim is formed by patch reefs. Okay, so it's not, it's, it's difficult to say that it encloses the, encloses the entire lagoon. But the point is that this really depends on our classification of an atoll. It really depends on, on the definition of how much we want that atoll to enclose the lagoon before it becomes an atoll. So Darwin didn't know what to think either. He basically said that the, uh, the Glover's Reef has so completely the form of atolls that if it had occurred in the Pacific, I should not have hesitated about coloring it in blue. Okay, so he reveals a bit of a confirmation bias here. He's suggesting that if he saw this in the Indo-Pacific, he would call it an atoll. But because it's here in the Caribbean, it doesn't quite fit in with his theory because there's not supposed to be any substance in the Caribbean, that it shouldn't be here. So he didn't recognize it. So let's carry on then. So we can see that apart from this bias, Darwin was correct. There is, it is very difficult to, to identify uh, with certainty if there are atolls in the Caribbean. A lot of them don't, don't look the same as, as they do in the Indo-Pacific. And the same can be said to a certain extent for barrier reefs and, and to a lesser extent fringing reefs too. So this raises significant, significant uncertainty about what type of reefs exist in the Caribbean. So what I want to do today is, is trying to address these three questions. Um, that basically what reef types exist in the Caribbean? Where do these reef types occur? And how does the geomorphology compare? So let's start off with the first question. What reef types exist in the Caribbean? Well, we need two things to be able to answer this question. We need a standardized classification of coral reefs. And second, we need to count all 
car all these reefs, all these reef types in the Caribbean. So if you if you want to construct a, a classification, it's got to be something that's fairly comprehensive. In other words, it should cover all types of reefs. It should be friendly, uh, uh, should be user friendly, so anybody can use it. Anybody can classify reefs. You don't have to be an expert. It should also convey an accurate mental image of the physical character of the reef you're trying to describe. And the descriptive criteria that you use in, in the classification should also give us an insight into the reef genesis, into its development. Okay, so this is the classification we've come up with. And it costs, consists of basically four steps or, or, or four stages that you need to go through so you can classify reefs. The first stage is related to water depth. The second stage is related to the form of the reef. The third stage is related to its maritime setting. And the fourth stage is related to its shallow geomorphology. So let's go through this um, one step at a time to give you an idea of how to, to familiarize you with, with how we classify or how we classify reefs using this classification. So the first step is to distinguish between reefs that um, are intertidal and the MP fairweather waves, so they cause waves to break over them. These are breakwater reefs. And the, the, their opposite category are submerged reefs. And these reefs are obviously submerged below sea level and they don't cause wave breaking. Now, breakwater reefs are obviously easy to see because they cause wave, waves to break over them. So you can actually see them on Google Earth. But submerged reefs are much more difficult to see because you need very good images to be able to make out exactly where they are because they're, they develop in deep water, as we can see here. You can see the breakwater reef this is around Grand Cayman, and it's separated by a bedrock terrace and a shelf edge reef on the on the um, outer shelf, um, which is a submerged type of submerged reef. And so it's extremely difficult to see. So what we'll do is we won't talk about submerged reefs in this talk. We'll just concentrate on breakwater reefs. The second step is to classify reefs in terms of the form. So these so two, uh, two classes of breakwater reefs are linear and dispersed. Linear reefs are basically regular linear, curvilinear forms that we're familiar with, the, the fringing, the barrier, the pharaoh, and the atoll. And dispersed reefs are irregular and nonlinear. We'll come back to those in a minute. But first, let's look at linear reefs. We've got our four types, fringing reefs. We basically standardize fringing reefs to have lagoons less than 10 meters in depth, right? Barrier reefs to have lagoons 10 meters or greater. Pharaohs are basically small atolls with a diameter of less than five kilometers. And atolls themselves have a diameter of greater than five kilometers. Now, both of these are enclosed, enclosed 75% of the lagoon. Right. So these are standardizations that we've made so that we, it makes identifying and defining these categories fairly straightforward. You only need to know depth, how much of the lagoon is enclosed, and what the diameter is. Okay, so it's fairly straightforward. The part of the second step is also related to dispersed reefs. So this is the other class of reefs in the breakwater reef section. Now these are irregular or nonlinear. And they're basically composed of either fields of patch reefs, of ridges, or ridges that are arranged in cells. And, and we're still working on this, um, this class. But so far, we've identified four main types. Granular reefs are formed of small, isolated patch reefs that form large fields that occur in open, open waters. And you can see that the waves break on the patch reefs and, and but you don't actually see the waves breaking because they don't form uh, normal waves that you'd find on like a fringing reef. The second type are what we call lobular reefs. And these are patch reefs that are basically merged and formed lobe-like or irregular uh, patch reefs. Okay. Then we've got reticular reefs. And these are basically ridges that are branched or, or, or irregular. 
Okay, and then the final one is cellular, in which these ridges are formed in closed networks. Okay, so we won't talk about these um, dispersed reefs anymore because we're we're still working on them. What we'll do is we'll concentrate on on the linear breakwater reefs. So the third step that you can see in this slide is the maritime setting. Okay, so we've got four maritime settings. We've got an interior setting which occurs in sheltered lagoons and bays, which are protected basically from uh, swell and storm waves. Then we've got coastal fringing reefs or coastal reefs. And these form bordering mainlands or islands. And the distinction here is that they have narrow shells less than five kilometers wide. Then we have bank reefs. And bank reefs form on shells that are wider than five kilometers wide or offshore banks. And then the final one is oceanic, where reefs form in areas where there's no shelving substrate and water depth um, dips deeply into water depths that are greater than 200 meters. So these are fairly standard definitions. And all we've done basically is to put in some numbers for coastal and bank to differentiate between narrow and wide shells. Okay. So the final step is the shallow geomorphology. And we identify two types, flat types and crest types. The flat types consist of reefs that have a back reef that's a in an intertidal flat, a horizontal intertidal flat. Whereas crest type reefs, the back reef is a subtidal slope. So basically this, it slopes down from the crest to the lagoon. It forms a nice gradual slope. And you, you can distinguish them on Google Earth fairly easily because um, flat types develop islands on the, on the reef flat. Basically because what happens is these flat type reefs they filter out all of the wave energy. And so islands and mangroves are able to form in the low wave energy areas of the back reef. And also what happens is the lagoon fills with mangrove. Also, you can also have um, shoreline advance all the way to the, almost all the way to the crest of these, of these flat type reefs. So one way of distinguishing them on Google Earth is you can see that you form these wave trains. So as the wave breaks over the crest, what happens is the wave reforms or forms these um, wave trains that travel across the crest um, because it's still providing a lot of friction, right? And if you compare that to flat type reefs, the reefs actually break at the crest, but you don't get any ripples or any, any uh, wave trains that are forming in the back reef, because basically what, what happens is the water depth is deepening from the crest towards the lagoon. So there's less and less friction as the waves move into the lagoon. Okay, so that's a way of distinguishing between flat and crest type reefs. So if we look at all these different uh, four steps, we can, we can generate 32 linear breakwater reefs. Okay, we can identify 10 reef types in interior settings, eight reef types in coastal settings, eight reef types in bank settings, and six reef types in oceanic settings. Now, all of these reef types might not appear in, in, in a particular area. But these are the, these is a, this is the maximum total that you can have of linear breakwater reef types, OK? So we've now got our classification. Um, what we need to do now is count and measure all reefs in the Caribbean. And this is the hard part. Uh, the only real way to do this is to use Google Earth. So during the COVID lockdown, that's basically what I did, I spent two years measuring every single and classifying and measuring every single reef in the Caribbean. Now, Google Earth is obviously very good, but it, you can't find images or clear images of all reefs in the Caribbean. For example, if you go to the Nicaragua Wise, you can't find any images showing reefs that develop around the Pedro Bank or the Serenia Bank, right? And so we've estimated that we can't see approximately 5% of reefs in the Caribbean. The same goes for the, actually for the atolls or, or for the so-called atolls in the Belize Barrier Reef. And you, although you, they, they have low resolution images, you can't see the detailed structure of the, of the, of the reefs themselves. Okay. 
So what happened when we did all this, when we finished all accounting uh, and classifying, what did we find? Well, out of the total of 32 possible linear breakwater reefs, we found that 16 types were present. And they had a total length of over 2,000 kilometers, which is basically the distance from Cancun to Bogota, Colombia, or Cancun to Washington, D.C. 80% of those were fringing reefs, and only 20% were bar reefs, pharaohs, and atolls. And so what did we find? In interior settings, we found four out of the 10 types possible. None of them were very common. In the coastal settings, we only found six types present, and all six of these were common. In bank settings, we only found six types as well, and only three of these were common. And in the oceanic settings, we didn't find any reefs whatsoever in the oceanic settings in the Caribbean. So out of this total, we had a series of nine common reef types in the Atlantic Caribbean. So let's take a look at some of these common reef types to familiarize ourselves with the differences. So here you can see flat type coastal fringing reefs. And these basically form, these basically form 33% of all fringing reefs in the Caribbean. And we've got two types. We've got those that are attached to the shore, like this one here in San Blas in Panama. And we've also got flat type reefs that are detached from the shore, like this one here in Mahawal. Okay, so in addition to flat type coastal fringing reefs, we've also got crest type coastal fringing reefs. And these are the most common type of fringing reef in the Caribbean. They make up 43% of all fringing reefs. And actually this detached type here is the most common reef type in the Caribbean. This is, what, this is the one from Punta Maroma in Mexico. Okay, there's also another type of an attached type, but this is much less common. And we're not sure whether this is a, a good, uh, um, has distinct characteristics because it's often the case that it seems the lagoon is filled up with sediment or, or mangrove. And so you can't, it's actually a, a detached type that, that is um, where the shoreline is prograded in low energy areas. But anyway, apart from those complications, those are crest and flat type fringing reefs. Now, if we move into the bank setting, We've also got fringing reefs, and they form 24% of all fringing reefs. 24% of all fringing reefs are bank fringing reefs, so they're fairly common. And we've got two types. We've got flat types, like this one in Ternefi in Belize, and we've got crest types, like this one in Cayo Cantiles in Cuba. So you can see the flat types have typically got um, islands on the reef flat, sediment islands and mangroves, and the lagoons are filled with mangrove, right? Whereas the crest types are much more open. There's no, there's no uh, islands on the crest. There's very little back reef area. And the back reef area is swept by currents, um, basically allowing patch reefs to develop. So those are very, the very, very typical differences between the two types. Now, if we move on to barrier reefs, we also found barrier reefs in coastal settings, but they're not that common. And that's probably due to the uh, deleterious effects of the coastal environment with things like flooding and turbidity. Here we can see there are two types of coastal barrier reef. Flat types, like here in the Bahia de Caracol in Haiti, and crest types, like this one in Roatan in Honduras. This one in the Bahia de Caracol in Haiti, this flat type reef is developed about four kilometers from shore. So it's not quite on a, on a bank but it's, it's quite a distance from shore, so it's quite well developed, which is unusual. Whereas this one in Ro Roatan is much close to the shore, which is just here, and you can see that it's broken by these um, channels that are obviously quite deep and have been kept open for a long time. In some cases, they're, they're closed over here, for example. And these must be related to uh, fluvial or riverine events that flood, you know, that cause flooding and, and, and basically destroy uh, make things difficult for, for reefs to grow in these environments. Now, if we move on to um, bank settings, barrier reefs are much more common because we're away from the influence of the, of the land, okay? And there's two types again, flat type and crest type. 
This flat type at Los Rockies in Venezuela is quite interesting. And quite characteristically, what you see is the development of these lobes into the lagoon. And this results from sediment bypassing over the, over the reef flat, which is very shallow. And this sediment is channelized and basically crosses the reef flat in little channels. These channels might, uh, basically cause little deltas to form uh, in the, just as it moves into the deeper water into the lagoon. So you get this rather irregular back reef boundary. Whereas in crest types, you get a much straighter boundary because the sediment is usually transported uh, en masse. It doesn't, it isn't channelized. It's gradually moved across the reef flat during uh, high, wave, high wave energy events, okay? All right, so we've familiarized ourselves with the classification and we've looked at the common reef types. The next question we need to answer therefore is where do these reef types occur? And to answer this question, again, we need two things. We need to divide the Caribbean into separate zones, and then we need to analyze which reefs occur in, in which zones and what are the differences, okay? So luckily for us, the Caribbean has already been divided into uh, eco zones by Spalding et al. in 2007. So we don't need to reinvent the, the wheel to divide the Caribbean, it's already been done. Now these boundaries are arbitrary, okay? Um, although there is some formal differences in these areas, uh, as described in Spalding, these boundaries are basically meant so that we don't have any reefs underneath them, okay? So we're able to use this as merely just as a tool to identify what reefs occur where. So if we look at the distribution of reefs, in this area, in these ecozones, distribute these reefs between the ecozones. This is what we find. We can find, we can see that, you can see the distribution differences between fringing reefs, barrier reefs, and atolls. But before we talk about the differences in distribution, let's look at the actual number or the amount of reef by length in each ecozone. And as you can see, the west ecozone that's the one that we're in, has basically got the highest number of reefs or the, the longest number of reefs in the entire, in any eco zone. And this basically protects almost 14% of the coastline. So this number here is the length of reefs in that particular eco zone. And this percentage below it is a percentage of the coastline that it protects. So you can see that the West is number one. And places like Florida and the Bahamas and the Gulf of Mexico, well, for example, the Gulf of Mexico only has 100 kilometers of, of reef length. It only protects about 3% of the coast. And the same with the East Caribbean, very few, very limited number of reefs. Okay. So, for example, in the West Eco region, uh, which includes the Mesoamerican Reef, We've got the most reefs, 600 kilometers of reef. We've got the most reef types. We've got 10 reef types out of the total of 16 that were present. And these reefs protect the most coast of any eco region. So although the Mesoamerican reef isn't the second longest reef, barrier reef in the world, it is the longest uh, reef section in the Caribbean with almost 600 kilometers. It's got the most diversity of reef types and it protects the most amount of coast. And if you include the southern Gulf of Mexico into this area, then it's also got the three longest unbroken reef tracts. The longest unbroken reef tract is Alacranes on the Campeche bank that forms a 34 kilometer long reef that's completely unbroken, continuous reef. Um, but Lighthouse and Chinchorro Bank come close behind being at 30 and 33 kilometers. So there's not much in it. These three reefs really dominate the rest of the Caribbean. OK, so let's come back now to the differences in the distribution between these uh, fringing reefs, but specifically the fringing reef types, because they're the most common. So as we can see, fringing reefs are ubiquitous in all areas. They dominate all areas except the, the Gulf of Mexico. South Southern Gulf of Mexico, which is dominated by Alacranes, as we've just seen. And you can see in some areas, like the East, for example, they're all fringing reefs. 
and the same with the Central West and uh, very close to Central East. These are the areas where fringing reefs dominate the most. And you can see that barrier reefs, atolls and pharaohs dominating the Gulf of Mexico and are present in the West ecoregion and are also present in the South, but they're very rare in the Central and the East and Florida, the Bahamas. So if we divide these fringing reefs up and look at the difference between crest and flat types, we can see, for example, that crest type fringing reefs are very common in the northern ecozones. They're common in the Florida Bahamas, common in the Gulf of Mexico South, they're common in the West, and they're common in the Central West. And they're rare in the South and East. Okay, they're much less common in especially the south very very rare. they're not very common there at all they do occur in the east and they do occur in the central east what about flat types well flat types are the opposite flat types are almost absent in the florida bahamas they're absent from the southern gulf of mexico they're not very common in the west or the central west eco zones and they dominate in the central east and the south eco zones Okay, so let's recap what we've found from this work so far. We found that the Caribbean has a total of 16 reef types, nine of which are fairly common. 80% of these are coastal and bank fringing reefs. The most abundant type is a detached crest type coastal fringing reefs. And fringing reefs dom dominate all areas, but flat types are rare in the north, but dominate in the south, whereas crest types are rare in the south, but dominate the north. So let's move on to the third and final question. And in fact, the most interesting question of all. How does the geomorphology of these different reef types occur? Surface geomorphology, how do they compare with each other? Are they bigger? Are they smaller? Do they have different um, back, larger back reef zones or larger reef front zones or steeper reef front zones? All of these different things. So what we need to do to identify any differences is we need to sample their morphometrics. Um, obviously, we need to sample the common types because the uncommon types are not that common, so we can't sample them. Not in the numbers that we require for statistical analysis anyway. And the second requirement is we need to determine the, the, the morphometric variation both within the individual types and between different types. Okay, so let's try and do that. So the first requirement is to sample the morphometrics. And what we did is we sampled the, the, the zones, the morphometrics of each zones along a one kilometer reef section where we could clearly see all of the geomorphic zones. And the first thing we did was we calculated the back reef area. And that's fairly straightforward from the crest to the back reef break. And you can identify the back reef break in Caribbean reefs because the lagoon is dominated by seagrass, whereas the back reef is dominated by sediments and patch reef. Then we calculated the reef front area, which again extends from the, the crest line, the reef crest, to the reef front break. Now, this is a slow break in the reef front that's quite distinct and separates the reef itself from the bedrock terrace. You can see the bedrock terrace here is very clearly uh, identified because it forms a different type of rugosity. It's very flat and not as rugose as the reef front itself. And then we've got this thing here which is the mid-shelf break. This mid-shelf break is an 8,000-year 8, coastline, and it's common throughout the Caribbean. It occurs roughly at the same depth. So if we measure the distance from the crest line to the mid-shelf break, we can get a good idea of the gradient of the reef front. So that was our third measure, our third morphometric uh, parameter. And of course, the fourth morphometric parameter is the sinuosity of the crest line. Now, instead of using the sinuosity of just that one kilometer section, what we did is we used the sinuosity of the entire reef itself, calculated the percentage um, that deviates from a straight line. OK. Now, there are some limitations using Google Earth for measuring these morphometric parameters. And the first is that a lot of images in Google Earth aren't that clear. And what I've done is I've put together three adjacent images from the same area. 
right? So you can see in 2018, in this particular area, you can't see anything in the reef front. You can see where the crest line is, but that's basically all you can see. In this image in 2020, you can start to see the spur and groove in front of the reef, in the reef front area, right? But you can't see any deeper. We can't see the mid shelf break. And only in 2021 do we get a good enough image to be able to identify all of the different parts. We can identify the back reef, the crest line, the mid shelf break, and the reef front, the reef front itself. Okay, so. If we don't have unclear images, we can't make any uh, measurements, no morphometric sample. And of the over a thousand reefs that we counted and classified, we could only sample 179 or about 18% of them for their morphometric characteristics. In addition to that uh, restriction or that subset, we also able, weren't, weren't able to see every single reef in the Caribbean. We estimated that we have about 95% of all reefs present in the Caribbean due to the lack of um, detailed uh, or res sufficient uh, images with sufficient resolution. And of the nine common types, we only had morphometric data for the analysis of seven. So that basically means we can't compare the reef morphology between all types, only the seven. We can't determine if the morphology of these types varies between maritime setting or ecozone. Okay. But what we can do is we can look at the morphological variation within each type and then see if these are different, if there are differences between the, between the different types. Okay, so if we look at the mean variation using these kernel density estimates for the seven reef type. Now, kernel density estimates are basically just a fancy histogram that shows the, the distribution. A frequency distribution. So we can see the frequency distribution for these seven reef types. And what you can see is that these flat type reefs here, 15, 11, and 13, so flat type coastal fringing reef detached, flat type coastal fringing reef attached, and flat type coastal barrier reef, these all have unimodal distributions in the average back reef length. And they also have unimodal distributions in the average reef front length and unimodal distributions in the reef front slope. If you look at the crest types, for example, you can see that these have these are much more polymodal. So there's more than one mode in both the average reef front length, uh, the average back reef length and the reef front slope. So this basically tells us then that flat types on a more of a very general uh, result is that flat types have a more uniform morphology than crest types. If we actually look at the numbers, the mean morphometric variables of all seven of, this, um, of the types we collected morphometric analysis from, you can see that the, the average width of the reef front here is quite narrow compared to crest types, which are the four below. And in addition to being narrow, it's also fairly steep, right? You've got um, a narrow reef front, then it means it must be steep. And in addition to this, you can also see that we've got a large back reef area when compared to crest type reefs. So the back reef area in flat types is much bigger than the back reef area in crest types. And finally, you can see that the sinuosity of the crest line in flat types is a little bit higher than it is in crest types. OK, so basically we've been out these um, mean morphometric variables show that we have two morphotypes. We've got a flat morphotypes that have got narrow reef fronts with a steep reef front slope and a very wide back reef with a sinuous crest line. Whereas a crest morphotype, although they're more irregular, more, more polymodal, the general trend is to have similar reef front and back reef area sizes that are similar, and to have a more gentle reef front slope and a straighter crest line. So let's try and explain or summarize then why this should be. 
We've got flat type reefs that are rare in the north, but dominate the southern ecoregions, but we don't know why. We've got flat type reefs that have more uniform morphologies, but that are different from the crest types. Again, we don't know why. And one of the reasons is that the, the data that we're collecting is basically abundance, distribution, and morphology. We've got no oceanographic or environmental data to analyze so we can see if there's any connection, if there's any correlation with any of these, any of these parameters. So we really can't answer the why questions just yet. And what we can do instead is we can start to formulate some testable hypotheses by considering other data from these types of reefs. So for example, we could consider um, reef anatomy data that's generated from drilling into these reefs. Now, if we had a single reef type, we might expect that this reef anatomy would have the same internal structure. Being a, being a single type with only three stages of development, you'd expect them to have the same internal structure, just be different sizes. Whereas different reef types might give you different internal structures. So this might be one way of being able to identify whether these two flat and crest type reefs are independent reef types, if they're different from each other. Okay, if they're distinct reefs. So we do actually have drilling data from both flat type and crest type reefs. So this, this example here is from Galeta Point in Panama. And this is a typical flat type reef. You can see from the, 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 the figure or the, the photograph on, on this side of the slide that they drilled on the reef flat here. And the reef flat only is only ankle deep, right? So you can see lumps that are sticking up above above sea level. So this is very typical of reef flats, um, very shallow, fairly easy to drill a transect. So what they did is they drilled six core holes across the reef flat and three core holes down the reef front to, to basically reconstruct the development of this, of this reef um, completely, com a complete reconstruction, including both back reef and reef front zones. And what they found was that this reef is composed basically of the reef crest coral Acropora palmata. And this started to develop around 8,000 years ago at about 15 meters below sea level. And as sea level gradually rose over, the, over that subsequent uh, seven, 8,000 years, these reefs accreted vertically and kept pace with sea level rise. Okay, so they basically got this vertical framework accretion as sea level rises. So this is a very standard uh, model of, of, of reef development. The interesting thing is that there's also been some work on um, reconstructing crest types. This is a work that I did in Punta Maroma in 2017, and we drilled 12 cores over the uh, reef front in Punta Maroma. The first couple of cores, F1 and F2, were drilled on the uh, bedrock terrace and recovered bedrock, right? But the other 10, which you, which you can see here, recovered the reef deposit of the reef front, almost up to the, to the crest line itself. And what we found was that this reef is composed of clasts of Acropora palmata, not in situ colonies. These are discrete clasts that have been rolled around and broken. Okay, every now and then you can see an in situ head coral, but these aren't that common. Okay, 95% of the reef sequence itself is formed by these class of Acropora palmata. So when we reconstructed reef development using these cores, as you can see here, we found that the reef started to develop in the reef front about five to 6,000 years ago. And what happened is it gradually migrated or advanced both in a, in a landward direction and also in a seaward direction. But most of the accretion was in a landward direction. So it basically moved backwards in time over a sand and gravel deposit, which is the basic of the back reef. So it retrograded, retrograded over its back reef through time. But the question is why? Why is this such a radical difference from the vertical accretion of the, of the fringing reefs, of the, of the flat type fringing reefs in uh, Panama? Why should it be so different? 
Well, the answer, of course, is that these crestite reefs are, their structure is basically formed by hurricanes. And this stems from the fact that we've got these large hurricane, the large, very large waves that develop during hurricanes that can reach up to 10 to 15 meters high. So if you move a 10 to 15 meter high wave over the shelf, it actually breaks in the reef front area. And you can see that the first thing it will encounter as it crosses the shelf is this mid shelf break because this, this bedrock sticks up and forms a scarp or a slope, a steep slope. And as the waves pass over this, this is only 10 meters deep. So a 15 meter wave will basically start to break as soon as it hits the mid shelf break. So what will happen then is that big wave will crash over the reef front and it will destroy any coral that is growing on the reef or in this area, any coral whatsoever, right? That coral will then be transported upslope basically to a distance that's proportional to the, to, the, to the energy of the wave and they'll be deposited as a ridge of rubble that forms below sea level, that forms at, at the, in the intertidal zone, right? So it's like a, a rubble ridge, a storm ridge. Now, what happens after the hurricane's over is that this rubble ridge is then recolonized and the reef recovers. And then Nakapura Pamata regrows again over this area. Um, and the reef recovers over 10, 15 years until the next hurricane hits and the same process repeats itself. Now, you might think, that, well, OK, yeah, hurricanes can destroy reefs that's that's fairly fairly well accepted but if you think of this reef over thousands of years we know it's at least five or six thousand years old then if you consider that these big hurricanes will hit this area once every 300 years then we're looking at you know between 20 and 40 times when this reef has been destroyed by hurricanes over that time period so this produces a a cycle of destruction and recovery through time that produces this completely different structure um, that's composed of class that retrograde over its back reef through time. So how do we know that this, um, this crest type reef structure is controlled by hurricanes in other areas? Well, a big clue is if you look at the distance between the crest line and the mid shelf scarp. And you can see that in almost all areas where you get crest type reefs, the crest line follows the position of the mid shelf scarp, which is only 300 meters away. Right, so you can see it in Punta Maroma. Here you can see it in Grand Cayman. There's a mid shelf, mid shelf scarp, mid shelf break. Here you can see it in Cuba. Nicely, nicely defined mid shelf break. And here you can see it in Chinchorro. Again, a little bit, the distance is a little bit higher, but still, it's fixed to this mid shelf scarp. So this gives us a good indication that this hurricane control on crest type reefs is fairly, fairly common in, in other reefs in the area, not just Ponte Maroma. So now we've been able to identify that both fringing reefs, crest type fringing reefs and flat type fringing reefs, not only do they have um, different distributions, different geomorphologies, they also have different internal structures. So what this enables us to do is to formulate some hypotheses. And the first hypothesis, of course, is that hurricanes control the, 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 uh, the generation of crest type reefs. And what we can do is we can make some predictions. And the first prediction will obviously be that crest type reef distribution should have a positive correlation with hurricane frequency, especially big storms with a corollary that crest type reefs will be absent where hurricane frequency is low, right? And a second prediction is that flat type reefs, on the other hand, will have a negative correlation with hurricane frequency and that flat type reefs will only occur where protected from hurricanes. So as you can see in these um, hurricane probability distributions, these maps here, you can see that category one and two hurricanes are fairly common throughout the entire Caribbean. They basically affect most areas. Okay, but if you look at the category three and five storms, they're basically concentrated in the northern area around this central, this is basically called the Hurricane Alley. Okay, 
So if we look at the distribution of crest and flat type reefs, we can see that crest type reefs occur in areas one, two, three, and four, eco zones one, two, three, and four, where hurricane with a, with a frequency of large uh, category hurricanes is common. So the frequency is high. Oops. But if we look at flat type reefs, they occur in a different area. They occur in eco region five, six, seven, and eight. And as you can see, intense hurricanes are fairly rare in these areas. So this is exactly what you predict if um, hurricanes were a primary control on the distribution of crest type reefs. Okay, so this explains crest type reefs, but it really doesn't have say anything about flat type reefs. It suggests where flat type reefs shouldn't be. But what controls the morphology of flat type reefs and why they're different from crest type? Well, flat type reefs are not that affected by hurricanes. So what are the main controls on their development and distribution? Well, if you look at these maps of sea surface temperature in January and July throughout the Caribbean, you can see that there's a very large temperature range north of uh, Cuba and Hispaniola and, and Puerto Rico. To the north, you've got a high temperature rate. For example, in the northern, northern Bahamas, we have an eight degrees Celsius range in temperature throughout the year. Whereas Belize, for example, south of this area never falls below 26. So we have a much smaller temperature range sea surface temperature range in the Caribbean. So these areas to the south, these areas here have a much more stable, uh, constant temperature throughout the year. So if flat type reefs coincide with lower annual sea surface temperature range in the south, what does this predict? Well, for example, one prediction might be that reef type, uh, flat type reef distribution should reflect the distribution of a particular stenothermic uh, reef benthos like crustose colon algae. And it raises the question, um, raises questions about the distribution of crustose colon algae like um, hydrolithum pachyderma and lithophone congestum and ask if they're actually temperature restricted. Um, so a corollary then would be that the, if this is the case, then the benthic ecology of flat type reefs will be different from crest type reefs. And it could be, for example, that the, the, the stronger presence or the, or the presence of um, massive crust, crust, uh, crustose coronal algae, like these two species of coronal algae, allow the binding of the reefs and allow the generation of steeper slopes. So they generate reefs with different morphologies. So this is uh, an alternative hypothesis. So let's try and wrap this up and summarize and draw some conclusions. So we've used a new classification to categorize and count all reefs in the Caribbean and identify different reef types in each ecozone and sampled about an 18% um, subset of their, of their morphological variation. We've identified 16 morphological types, 16 types, nine of which are fairly common. And uh, fringing reefs are dominated in all areas and a key finding is, of course, that flat and crest type reefs have different morphologies and occur in different areas. Flat type reefs are more uniform. They have a more constrained morphology, but they're rare in the north, whereas crest type reefs are less uniform, but common in the north. Um, but we can't explain these differences. We don't know why these morphological and, and, um, and distributional differences occur. But we have been able to, using the, the, the um, data from the reef, in, the internal structure of the reef, we're now to identify two hypotheses that we can test. Now, we can test these hypotheses by adding in environmental and ecological data into the morphometric analysis. So that's what we, that's what we'll uh, do over the next, um, that'll be our next project. So let's draw some conclusions then. Darwin didn't mark any barriers or atolls in the Caribbean for two reasons. 
First, he naturally assumed that the reefs in the Caribbean would look like the reefs that he found in the Indo-Pacific. But unfortunately, he found that they didn't. And he thought they were basically poorly developed. He also assumed that these reefs in the Caribbean would just be just like in the Indo-Pacific. They'd, they'd be a single reef type with three superficially similar stages. But what he found instead was he could only find the first stage. And the other, the other um, types he couldn't find or he didn't want to mark or they looked different. Okay, He never actually considered that there might be more than one type of reef in the Caribbean. There might be, what about different types of reefs? Maybe there are more than one type of reef in the Caribbean and this might solve the problem. This single reef type with stages idea has remained the ruling paradigm in both ecology and geology for the last 180 years. In terms of ecology, the ecological variation is seen primarily as um, a, a function of succession with pioneer and climax stages being driven by environmental processes or competitive interaction. And as Tom Gross says, modern reefs are not stable and mature communities, but are undergoing successional changes typical of the youthful assemblages. So for example, this is where the inter intermediate disturbance hypothesis comes in and hurricanes reset the level at which these, or the stage in which these reefs um, are. Okay, so this is the typical view, the ecological view of differences, ecological differences between reef types. And geologists, is no, geologists are no better. They basically view reefs as, this, as the same sort of thing, a developmental sequence with immature medium and mature stages that are controlled by extrinsic factors, things like substrate or sea level change. And you can see this in, for example, over here in Geister's e ecological zonation based on wave energy. He's basically assuming that this is all one type of reef and the only variation is wave energy. Okay, and this causes differences in the assemblages through time. And again, here in 1982, Hockley identified these reefs in the Great Barrier Reef is being formed through a series of young, medium, and old reef stages as they relate to the position of the substrate and sea level change. But what if these variations that we can see in ecology and geology were actually, they actually reflect multiple reef types instead? So what we've done is we've upset the ruling paradigm by showing that in the Caribbean, there are two reef types, which form in different areas with different morphologies and different internal structures. Reefs in the north are impacted by hurricanes and the morphologies internal structures are quite different from Indo-Pacific reefs. Whereas flat type reefs in the south are less impacted by hurricanes their morphologies internal structures are quite similar to Indo-Pacific reefs. Now we're not saying that reefs with different stages don't exist and it seems likely in fact that the crest type reefs considering that they have a multimodal um, poly, uh, morphometrics that these reef types may may include reefs with different stages of development. Instead what we're basically predicting is that if there is two reef types morphological reef types controlled by different environmental processes, then they should have significant ecologic and geological differences. So we've basically generated more questions that we've actually answered, which is almost like our ignorance is increasing. So what we need to do now then is to test the link between morphology and the, and the environmental data like waves from hurricanes and exposure to hurricanes, and also see if the ecologies are controlled by, if there's an ecological difference between these two reef types and it's controlled by the annual temperature range. So I'd like to, think, like to thank quite a few people who helped in this um, study. Obviously a big study like this um, means we have to include a lot of people to help and a lot of statistic analysis was done by Alexis Medina and Edlin uh, Guerra in, in um, over there in uh, Ennis. So we thank these guys very much. They helped us very much organize these ideas in this paper. And any of the references I've stated, you can see here. And there's also the, the address of the, of the two YouTube videos I've made on, on some of these topics.
So I can answer questions if anybody has them. If you're still awake, nobody's fallen asleep. <laughs> ah, no, claro que no. Muchas gracias. <laughs> sí, sobre todo lo que lo que comentabas hace un momento, ¿no? Que eh, al generar este conocimiento salen más preguntas, ¿no? Que... <laughs> <laughs> Exacto. <laughs> Pero bueno, es parte de, de la gracia, yo creo. Pues por ahora tenemos un, un par de preguntas y e invitamos a, pues, a la audiencia a animarse a aprovechar la interacción directa con el doctor Blanchón. Entonces, por un lado, Cecilia Enríquez eh, bueno, le felicita por la publicación del artículo y dice, me pregunto si hay alguna relación entre los resultados y las zonas en las que las corrientes, por su intensidad, son capaces de levantar las isotermas y proveer agua fría. Las corrientes de frontera oeste. Esta distribución de agua fría sería subsuperficial y no se vería en las imágenes de SST. Sí, yeah, of course. Por supuesto. Es, es única, estoy únicamente diciendo que el, el rango de temperatura durante el en different deposits del Caribe, porque eso es, es más fácil a ver. Pero por supuesto hay diferentes factores environment, que es, uh, environmental que es implicado en este sistema. Por supuesto, si hay corrientes um, frío, normalmente estas corrientes son más nutritivos también, porque tienes más disuelto nutrientes y cosas como este, y puede tener diferencias en ecología. Entonces, pero mi idea con el, los crystals corallines es, yo fui buscando para la literatura donde yo puedo ver una diferencia entre la distribución de este tipo de corallines. Y no, no puedo encontrar. De hecho, necesito hablar con Bob Stenny, con una persona que es un especialista en esta área. O personas como ustedes, como ecólogos, que tienen data efectivamente en este arrecife. Y ese es, el, obviamente, ese es el próximo etapa. Es mucho más, más difícil a hacer estas pruebas. Entonces, obviamente, necesitamos usar proxies de estas diferencias en diferentes áreas. Entonces, podemos usar proxies donde tenemos un valor en cada parte del Caribe. Entonces, en cada recife podemos caracterizar la temperatura, la ecología, el viento, las olas, el expuesto de huracanes. Entonces, esta información es obviamente muy difícil de encontrar. Entonces, esta es la limitación de este tipo de estudios. Necesitamos saber como todos los áreas en el Caribe, para generar un, un, un mejor idea cómo funciona el sistema. Entonces, no es fácil. Sí, ¿no? Como información difícil de lograr y de tantos sitios diferentes y que luego estandarizarla y todo, ¿no? Es, es bastante complejo. De, de hecho, hay investigadores en CISAL que están handcasting los, 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 la clima y hace predicciones del tamaño de las olas. Y de hecho, podemos usar este tipo de información para generar eh, números específicos para el tipo de energía de las olas en diferentes partes del Caribe. Entonces, necesito hablar con ellos específicamente. Ojalá están mirando este vídeo. No sé, creo que tenemos colegas como, por ejemplo, de Cecilia o Ismael o el propio José Pintado, que tal vez se lo puedan preguntar. Exacto. Seguro que les ha llamado mucho la atención. Muy bien. Ismael Mariño eh, dice, hola Paul, saludos de mi parte. Muchas gracias por tu presentación. Es ilustrante poder ver un trabajo que ordene y clasifique los tipos de arrecifes que observamos en la naturaleza. Es muy necesario. Y la pregunta es... ¿Crees que hemos desarrollado suficiente conocimiento, velocidad de acreción, fuerza necesaria para romper un coral, etcétera, para pensar en la construcción de un modelo computacional simplificado de la morfología arrecifal capaz de correr por milenios? Sí, yo pienso que sí. ¿Por qué necesitamos un supercomputer? <risa> para poner... Para, para, para modelar el crecimiento, la destrucción, la disposición y el este, este, este avance en tiempo. Porque no, nada más es, es, es 
uh, função em uma área. É uma área muito grande. Então, obviamente, a mais grande área que tem, mais dados que tem, um computador com mais, mais poder necessitamos usar. E, obviamente, isso é bom para as pessoas que estão enfocadas em, em modelando os, os sistemas naturais. Mas para nós, para geólogos, podemos reconstruir esta história usando a estrutura internal do Recife. Então, para nós, essa é a razão de eu introduzir o dado da anatomia do Recife. Porque podemos ver em, mil, em miles de anos que está funcionando neste Recife. A única dificuldade é sacando este, este núcleo. Não é fácil a, a taladrar no Recife, quando tem olas grandes e mal tempo, por exemplo. Estamos fazendo isso em Ponta Moromo, em Ponta... em Mahawal. Ahorita, estamos em Ponta Moromo, estamos poniendo outro modelo em Mahawal para comparar. Então, essa é, é uma etapa que também podemos incluir em este análise. Então, minha, minha vista é a passada, obviamente, não, não em modelando. Mas eu penso que umas pessoas podem usar esta informação. Vou a pôr todo o dado deste estudo, vou a publicar. Então, qualquer pessoa pode baixar o, o arquivo de KML, subir em Google Earth e ver qualquer arrecife. Tem a classificação, o, o morfométrico, os muestros que analisamos. Em tempo, diferentes pessoas podem poner mais informação, mais, mais análises de mais arrecifes. Depende de quando temos mais imagens, por exemplo, ou, ou possivelmente pessoas mais local podem checar os diferentes morfométricos, não? E, e nesta maneira avançamos. Sim, sí, este, este, este trabalho é muito preliminar. Só fazemos um muestro de 18%. É es, es nada. Não é muito limitada. Bom, bueno, mas é muito trabalho. Se me acaba de ocorrer, não sei se, se poderiam escuchar andar uma iniciativa em este Ocean Hackathon que vem próximo. <risos> <risos> Podría estar bien, creo que es en el próximo mes o algo así. Vamos a sí, sí, hay, dar la hay idea. Los hackers blancas afuera, no, vamos, vamos a reunir con ellos. <risa> bueno, a ver, tenemos una pregunta de Adrián Luznia. Dice, ¿cuál es el tipo de formación arrecifal con mayor biodiversidad? ¿Hay alguna relación con el tipo de arrecife o entre el tipo de arrecife y su biodiversidad? Sí, esa es la cosa, no sabemos. No sabemos cuál es el, no tenemos data, que, cuál, data ecológico para cada arrecife. Ese es el próximo etapa. Podemos analizar, por ejemplo, el ecología basado en los transectos que los, los ecólogos hacen en este, en este estudio. Si podemos usar una estandarización de la ecología, diferentes zonas. El problema en este momento que tenemos es los ecólogos no tienes que confundir en dónde están en el arrecife estás. Entonces, por ejemplo, ellos no saben dónde empezó el arrecife y cuándo terminó. Entonces, ellos continúan sus transectos en cima del depósito arrecifal, en el arrecife frontal, donde no hay, en el área de la plataforma enfrente del arrecife, donde no hay arrecife, pero hay corales. Entonces, no hay distinción. Entonces, estamos publicando también los análisis de la ecología del arrecife, no los ambientes um, en, lo, en los lados. Obviamente, una, un arrecife es un... Es una landscape, un, um, ¿cómo se dice? Ecological landscape. Y the ecological landscape uh, com is composed of, is compuesto de ar depósitos arrecifal que, es don, que está, tienes miles de años de, de edad y áreas donde no hay arrecife, solo hay corales. Por ejemplo, puede poner su coche como en un de su coche ¿eh? para una artificial reef site. Y los corales pueden crecer encima de tu coche, pero no son un arrecife, es un coche inundido. <risa> ¿No? Entonces hay muchas diferencias entre el, el zona ecológico y el arrecife. Y ese es un una problema que necesitamos enfrentar. Claro, la evaluación 
más biológica tendría como que estar muy de acuerdo con estas zonificaciones, ¿no? Y aparte ah, estar sí. ¿no? Entonces, Ajá, exacto. Bien, gracias. So, si hay, hay estudiantes que quieres hacer este tipo de cosa, estamos aquí. Exacto, exacto. Pues sí, estos seminarios siempre sirven como una llamada a desarrollar nuevos intereses, ¿no? Así tienen más, más opciones. Exactamente. Muy bien. Eh, a ver, pues otro estudiante, Jorge Iván, pregunta, ¿qué formación geomorfológica permite un mejor flujo de los arrecifes de coral? Mejor flujo, ¿en qué sentido? Me imagino que es flujo de, de agua, más hidrodinámica, no sé. Pues no ah, sé. ok, ok. Pues yo imagino que los, los arrecifes tipo cresta son más abiertos en términos de hidrodinámicos los reef flat reefs son ellos quitan toda la energía de la laguna y atrás de la laguna en el flat, todo de hecho hay una es muy impresionante a ver el costera atrás de una arrecife de reef flat el costera sube hasta el nivel de arrecife y cuando no hay arrecife regresa entonces como entra la arena en los, en los playas no puede escapar, porque no hay, no hay olas. Entonces, es muy, muy instructivo que, que eficiente ese tipo de arrecifes son restringiendo el, el olas. También los arrecifes, los dispersed reefs que encontramos en el otro tipo de breakwater reef, son súper eficientes en, en, en quitando las olas. Ellos forman estructuras mucho más amplias, y también tienes un arrecife frontal y tienes una laguna, pero no hay barrera. El barrera nada más es los, los, los puntos de patrips y ellos forman una, una... Efectivamente, ¿qué pasa? Ellos forman esta dispersión en la ola, destruyen la forma de la ola. Entonces, no hay olas efectivamente en esta área. Entonces, acumular sedimento, no hay movimiento, solo durante tormentas. Muy bien, gracias. Eh, el, el profesor José Carlos Pintado eh, agradece mucho la ponencia, excelente trabajo. Y entonces comenta, la relación de los crest type con huracanes parece estar clara. ¿Has analizado variaciones de largo plazo en las condiciones medias del oleaje? Por ejemplo, alturas significantes, dispersión de la energía en frecuencia o dirección. Sé que hay pocos datos de larga escala temporal, pero con los que existen hasta ahora, ¿has podido hacer algo? No, de hecho, no buscamos, para, no, no estamos explorando en ese momento el, el, el ¿cómo se llama? El, el energía de las olas. Vamos a, a incluir esta información en el análisis en el próximo etapa. Pero... En realidad necesitamos usar Hindcast data porque es la única data que es Caribbean wide. ¿No? La Hindcast data es generated, generada por los vientos. Entonces podemos decir cuál es el, por ejemplo, podemos usar el um, HS12, significant wave height that, that occurs over, um, that's most common over the uh, 12 months a year, the, most, uh, the, the, mean, the mean highest wave height. Y eso nos da una buena idea, una buena idea, cuál es la variación durante el año en, en lugares. Por ejemplo, en el Golfo de México, la, el norte es generar un sistema donde hay olas multidireccional y muy fuertes también. Entonces, los, los arrecifes en el Golfo de México son bien diferentes que los otros áreas en el Caribe. Porque en el otro área en el Caribe es unidireccional. No, vientos en una dirección, nada más. Entonces, el Golfo de México es el único lugar donde los olas son generados en dos direcciones. Y así tienes impacto en el tipo de arrecife que tenemos en el Golfo de México. Es súper interesante. Bueno, pues ya está, otros, otros estudiantes también, por favor. <risa> <risa> eh, Bechieva Hernández eh, le agradece también la charla, dice, ha estado muy interesante su plática y me ha inspirado en diversos aspectos para seguir estudiando estos sistemas. Ajá. A veces los, 
alumnos pues dicen que, que los arrecifes de coral, que todo el mundo le encantan, pero que por qué solo los arrecifes de coral, y bla, bla, bla. Entonces, bueno, pues también tienen que, yo les digo, pues también tienen mucha importancia, ¿no? Y hay procesos de mucho interés. Muy bien, Mario Alberto Macías dice, en los arrecifes de zonas planas, ¿Es posible que haya un mayor tipo de interacción con manglares o humedales a diferencia de los arrecifes de cresta? Y si es así, ¿no hay afectaciones con la mezcla de sedimentos o de agua con nutrientes debido a huracanes? Uh, ¿Otra vez? <risas> en los arrecifes planos, en los flat reef, ¿es Ajá. posible que haya más interacción con manglares o humedales a diferencia de los crest reef? Y si es así... ¿Esto podría afectar a la mezcla de sedimentos o de agua con claro. nutrientes? Sí, claro. Sí, por supuesto. Yo pensé que la ecología de los diferentes tipos son, son muy diferentes. Y eso es, eso es problemático para los ecólogos porque están diciendo que todos los arrecifes son la misma. ¿No? Entonces, una historia aquí puede comparar con una historia allá y no es la caso. Entonces, yo pensé que hay... Vamos a, vamos a tener un poco de resistencia de esta idea para clasificar los arrecifes usando la geomorfología antes de estudiando la ecología. Pues ojalá podemos reusar los datos que ellos colectar y identificar, identificar las diferencias. Es una muy buena pregunta para el doctorado, para examinar la ecología de estos diferentes tipos de, de arrecifes con diferentes morfologías. Si hay alguien, hay alguien afuera que quieres. Ojalá. Estoy pescando. Hay que tirar una red grande a día de hoy. ¿no? Sí, exacto. Muy bien. Jimena ST dice, desde una perspectiva académica, ¿cuál cree que sea el futuro de los arrecifes mexicanos con las problemáticas que se generan a partir del cambio climático? Pues yo pienso que para mucho tiempo que tenemos que es este arrecifes se llama zombie reefs. Son, fue, fue vivo, pero ahorita están muy marginal. Y yo pienso que es una historia triste, pero hay un hay una problema que yo, yo vi en este, este, este vista. Es si ve lo, el literatur de este la época del 60 y más temprana cuando fue explorando este arrecifes. Puede encontrar descripciones de arrecifes que no tienes coral. Entonces, yo pienso que como todas las personas, si quieres estudiar un arrecife, vas al arrecife con corales. ¿No? Porque es bonito, es va a muy bonito para gastar su tiempo allá. Y tenemos este uh, bias en la literatura. Este arrecifes que fue estudiado mucho porque tiene muchos corales. Los arrecifes que no tienes coral no fue estudiada. Por, es obvio, ¿no? Es natural, es normal. Pero este no significa que todos los arrecifes en todas las áreas siempre tienes coral. Yo pienso que hay estapas cuando tenemos una, una periodo cuando los arrecifes tienes mucho coral y un periodo cuando está destruido por huracanes y necesita más tiempo para recuperar. No, obviamente sí tenemos un efecto de cambio, uh, cambio climático, uh, global warming, y sí es destruyendo corales, sin duda. Pero la otra pregunta es, ¿es, todo, es lo mismo para todos los arrecifes? ¿Es lo mismo para flat-type reefs y crest-type reefs? La, la respuesta es no sé. Es una posibilidad que muchos de estos arrecifes no tienen coral por la estapa que están. ¿Y qué, qué estamos haciendo ahorita en nuestra investigación? Estamos haciendo una mapa de fechas del servicio del arrecife. Si este fechas tienes unidad moderno, sabemos que este arrecife se murió recientemente. Pero si este arrecife tiene una unidad que es más viejo que un mil años, por ejemplo, posiblemente es otra cosa. 
Entonces podemos medir, de hecho estamos haciendo es para Punta Maroma y Mahawal. Vamos a, en los próximos años vamos a investigar cuál es la edad del servicio de arrecifes. Para probar esta idea que los arrecifes todos son muriendo ahorita, a resultado del cambio climático global. Y, y con esto han encontrado como en sus núcleos, en algún, en algún caso, pues que hubiera arrecife con coral vivo, luego no y luego sí, o esto no se puede detectar. No, la única cosa que puede ver es el continuo, continuo, continuation, el continuación del crecimiento del arrecife, como un colonia en lugar de crecimiento. Y el próximo, el otro colonia empezando, el otro. ¿No? O podemos ver depósitos de clastos cuando, cuando el arrecife fue destruido por huracanes. Entonces, de esta manera podemos cuantificar, obviamente en, el, en los crest types, en los, en los núcleos, en este momento no encontramos ningún coral en, en Acropora, Parmat, en lugar de crecimiento. Ningún. Pero ese es un número, de, ese es un arrecife. Claro. No tenemos reconstrucciones de otros arrecifes y posiblemente podemos encontrar. Claro. Pero sí, es, es difícil a reconstruir exactamente el edad es cuando fue vivo y muerto al arrecife. Tal vez se podría hacer a través de restos de otro tipo de, de fauna que pueda vivir ahí. Ajá, exacto. Oh, sí, no. de la succession, ¿no? Sí. Ok. Bueno, tenemos más preguntas, entonces no, no vamos a demorarnos, a ver. Sofía Bernal López dice, ante los pronósticos del cambio climático y la pérdida de corales, ¿se puede predecir si va a existir alguna modificación en aportes de sedimentos en los arrecifes? Sí, sin duda. Um, obviamente, si no tienes el coral dominante como en Acroporopamata, el van a tener diferencias en la producción de sedimento. Es obvio, si no hay corales, los peces y los, los urchins no hay. Entonces sí van a, van a hacer diferencias en el sedimento. Okay, como es, es, me, me parece muy bonito que podamos enlazar como esta cuestión de sedimentación con la existencia de algunos organismos, ¿no? Que, el problema para nosotros es muy difícil recuperar el, el archivo sedimentario. Podemos tener núcleos en la laguna para sacar sedimentos, pero no hacemos este porque es poco difícil para sacar estos sedimentos hasta el, hasta el, el roca. Entonces estamos concentrando, es poco más fácil a sacar los núcleos que son sólidos, ¿no? es más fácil a taladrar. Para las lagunas posiblemente podemos usar un diferente metodología, pero ¿no? en este momento lo estamos concentrando en el, en el depósito a recipe. Claro. Ok, y tenemos una pregunta más de Ana Moreno. ¿Puede existir una transición o cambio en la clasificación de los corales ante eventos climáticos extremos? Me imagino que dice, de, más que de los corales, de los arrecifes, me imagino. No estoy seguro. ¿Cómo? ¿Y ¿Puede existir un cambio en la clasificación de los corales ante eventos climáticos extremos? No acabo de entender yo tampoco a qué se refiere, Ana. Um, ah, tal sí. vez si, si ante un evento extremo pueden cambiar de un tipo de arrecife a otro. Ah, buena pregunta. Sí. Buena pregunta. Yo pienso que no, porque los, por ejemplo, los huracanes, los olas no rompen en la cresta. Ellos rompió, los, los olas grandes rompió en el arrecife frontal. Entonces la cresta es afectada por corrientes nada más, pero no es destruido para los huracanes. ¿no? Únicamente si tienes un arrecife cerca del cuerpo de agua muy profundo, mm -hmm. vas a tener una, un impacto durante tormentas grandes. Pero si tenemos los shells, los shells basic, básicamente son, uh, protect, ellos protect, protect, hacen protección para el arrecife porque los olas crecen, lo, los olas grandes de los recanes rompen en frente del arrecife, no en el arrecife. Entonces yo pienso que no. Muy bien. 
más preguntas. Adriana de los Cobos pregunta, ¿existen cambios en las estructuras de las comunidades dependiendo del tipo de, arre del tipo de arrecife? Creo que es un poco lo que ya hemos hablado, ¿no? De, de, la ah. y, y... de hecho, la, la geomorfología del arrecife, estamos en un proceso de cuantificar usando dron. Vamos a volar un dron encima del arrecife como las 200 metros, y usa el dron para generar una digital elevation model de la recipe, que podamos ver los diferentes spur and groove y las diferentes estructuras. Y de esta manera podemos comparar, comparar directamente el estructura, el geomorfología de un arrecife y comparar directamente con, comparar con un otro arrecife. ¿no? Entonces podemos comparar directamente las geomorfologías. En este momento, la geomorfología que, usas, que están usando en la península es geomorfología generada por el imagen satélites. Y esta imagen tiene muchos artefactos. Por ejemplo, ellos no pueden quitar el, efectivamente el olas. Entonces, que, está, que puede ver en el, en el reconstrucción es de la pasimetría, es un artefacto de las olas, no de la estructura del arrecife. Entonces, estamos en este estado en este momento para recibir información más detallada en este, en este morfología. Obviamente, eso es súper importante para la geomorfología. Cuando tienes la geomorfología bien definida, puede proyectar la ecología directamente encima de eso. Y eso es súper importante. Podemos ver diferencias ecológicas y geomorfológicas y hacer pruebas entre las diferentes tipos de arrecife, es muy poderoso. Ocho, necesitamos otro estudiante para este también. Okay. <risa> <risa> bueno, unos que se queden por aquí también, por favor. <risa> Muy bien. Pues bueno, pues creo que ya está. Eh, veo que hay ¿no? eh, tantas preguntas, no está claro que ha generado pues esto, ¿no? Más cosas que se quieren saber de las que se han aprendido, ¿no? Pero, Mano, ha generado un gran interés, entonces, pues ojalá sí muchos de nuestros estudiantes y de, y de los colegas, ¿no? Se animen, pues, a explorar esta nueva perspectiva de los arrecifes en cuanto a ecología, en cuanto al vínculo con la oceanografía, hidrodinámica, ¿no? Pues te Perfecto. agradezco muchísimo eh, que nos hayas dedicado este tiempo. Eh, agradezco muchísimo también a la audiencia su participación y espero que hayan disfrutado este seminario. Nos vemos en un par de semanas. Perfecto, gracias Vanessa. Y también tenemos un, tengo un canal de YouTube donde puede ver este, este plática otra vez. Ah, perfecto. Yo creo que también se va a subir a, a las redes de, de la escuela y ahí perfecto. quedan todas en, en un repositorio por el largo plazo. Perfecto, muchas gracias.